Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today at this very dire time of the afternoon and on a Thursday. But let's get started. So the year is 2012. What were you doing back then? Perhaps you were studying something. Perhaps you had a different job. Maybe you switched career over the past 12 years. Many things have probably changed. At least for me, I would have ever expected that I would be in this uh, stage sharing some thoughts with you. 12 years ago, I was in Guatemala studying. And I'm pretty sure everybody had very different stories going on uh, back then. Um, but one thing that united us all across different countries and cultures and different stuff was something definitive. The Mayan apocalypse is about to happen, right? This was everywhere, all over the news. And some people thought it was serious and there were some kind of weird things happening. But at the end, we are still here, so I guess it didn't happen. But the other thing that was more defining of our modern world is that memes hit mainstream. And that really changed how we live today. And they, we still have it. Maybe the apocalypse is over, but the memes are still here. They have evolved so many times. And I was a student in computer science, so one of the things that I saw back in that era all the time was this one, uh, the classic. Read the funny manual. I was studying computer science, so every time I had a question, people would be like sending me variations of this all the time. And I think they would be canceled today. <laughs> but yes, uh, this happened to me. It was my daily bread when I had questions. I was trying to learn. Uh, but back then, we had manuals of 50 pages so, so, so we could watch TV. And we were supposed to watch, like read the entire manual so we could like use the remote control. What if I had to learn something really special or difficult like my SQL? Well, there's a manual for that. It's just that it's 5,000 pages plus, and I'm supposed to read it all and know it all, right? It's just, otherwise, I'm going to get sent a meme. Um, 12 years from now, things have changed quite a lot, right? Now, this is not how we approach learning. Learning in 2024 is different. And how does it look like? How do we learn something new, a new technology, a new project, and a new library? And that's what we have the documentation for. We have changed the word manual for something more comprehensive. And that's what this talk is about, towards great documentation. Uh, what does great documentation even mean? That's something that we'll discover throughout this talk. But first, um, let's talk about documentation in general. Like, what is documentation even in the first place? The, the docs, right? Docs are documentation, and that's pretty clear. But there's more to it. The project's website is also, oh no, I changed my slide by mistake. Uh, <laughs> let me introduce myself first. That's true, I was just so excited about the topic that I even forgot who I am. Uh, but I am Jorge Lain Fiesta. I am the author of the Linux Foundation uh, Introduction to Backstage course. And now I'm not working much with uh, Backstage, but I'm instead looking at a cooler place called Rootly. We do incident management. And yes, now I have to look at the screen. <laughs> um, I also studied digital communication at the UCLA and uh, Alborg University in Copenhagen. And most importantly, I am a certified sommelier, which means that I drink wine and I know how to do it, which is what matters, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, great. So now <laughs> let's get back to the topic for real about what is great documentation. And let's get to see what documentation is. And this is docs, right? Docs are fine. But then there's also the component of the website, which is a very defining aspect of documentation that we don't often consider. Because when you hear about a new project, on a podcast or somebody mentions it to you on KubeCon, you probably heard dozens of things that you didn't know existed over the conversation you had with friends or people that you know here. And you Google and, and then you find the website. How many times have you Googled a new project, a new open source thing, and then you're like, oh, I have no idea what this does or why is it useful at all to me? That's because the website is also a part of the documentation. It's very it's an entry point on even is it worth my time to keep digging into actually even reaching the docs section. So that's, that's why the website is an important piece of this puzzle of how we even learn about new things. Next, we have the README. Because for open source projects, it's not only about the website. You can also discover a new project through GitHub. 
Um, you've probably seen like trending repositories and stuff like that, and that's also why it's an entry point to, to get here. Uh, we also have the contributing file, which is a form of documentation because if, a, if another person's project doesn't get contributions, is it even open source? Or is it just like a sponsored company thing that is just open, kind of? So that's, it's an essential part, and we need to be enabling uh, contributors. Another thing that is part of it is um, the issues on GitHub. They are also a way of documenting what's going on. And we also have meta documentation about um, how we even orchestrating this whole thing. Because you've seen yourself that projects evolve fast. They really go really fast, especially when they become popular. So it's, unless you have a, a way of curating how this is gonna evolve, it's gonna go crazy and go wild. Um, However, it seems to me that there is some incoming communication. Let's see, I think it's coming from outer space or some kind of AI generated text. Oh, it's not playing. Well, whatever. <laughs> but this whole talk is inspired by a tech audit that happened. Uh, it was sponsored by the CNCF on the Backstage documentation. Backstage is a very complex project uh, it has hundreds of pages on documentation, and they took the, the work of going through all of the docs and figuring out what works and what doesn't work, what is confusing, which is a very commendable task. I have, done, I have never done it myself, but I just used their analysis. So in this talk, the methodology is basically going through the findings that they had and trying to get patterns that you could apply into your projects or to the projects that contribute to, and uh, that's the, the idea. Um, if you're interested in the output of this analysis, it took them months to get it done, is in this one meta issue in which they collected all the different recommendations for, oh, you need to restructure this whole uh, page, or you need to add this guide, or you need to change these parts in the sidebar. It's very practical information, and it could be interesting uh, to see how uh, transformation of a big project documentation can look like. So let's deep look into the backstage of the backstage tech audits. We have seen that they analyze documentation in three components. First is the project documentation, which is the docs parts. Then they also analyze the contributors documentation and the website. So let's look at first the project documentation. What does it take to make good project documentation? First, you need to understand who needs this documentation because the dif there's different people who want to use your project, your library, and you need to be able to cater for them. And one of the clear ones is new users, right? This is the whole purpose of having a project is that somebody else is using your project. So you need to make sure you have documentation that's ready and available and optimized for someone who doesn't have a lot of context and is interested in your project. And that is on a specific nature on the docs that you have to, to write. Another set of group is experienced users. You cannot give experienced users this intro guide. They have different use cases. They need to find specific information. Therefore, your documentation has to be structured also to take into account this user persona. And depending on the nature of the project, you also have user roles, which is essential. It can make things very easy to read or very hard if you don't recognize the right user roles. I'll give you a very practical example. Uh, in, um, okay. in the, um, the backstage documentation right now, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with it. Uh, so for me, it's, it's just always mean. I never understood it completely, but I knew how to move around it. And I didn't know how to make it easy to read. And the reason why it's complicated and the reason why it's hard to follow or understand even what's going on is because different user roles are convoluted into the same pages. So that makes it very hard because uh, the, the audit even identified four concrete personas in the case of Backstage. Because Backstage, I don't know, are, is anyone familiar with Backstage? Can you raise your hand? Okay. So for context, Backstage is a very complex framework. So it, it can be... It's usually installed by someone in an organization 
so developers can use it. So there's, those are the end users. Um, however, the end users need documentation because Backstage uh, has a lot of features. So the, the person who just wants to check out the catalog, which is one of the features, doesn't need to know how to install Backstage. They just need to know how to navigate the catalog. And then there's documentation for the admins, which are the ones who install Backstage. They require a lot more documentation, uh, but it's, it's a specific to their needs. And Backstage is optimized for inner sourcing, which means that it can be extended by other teams in the organization. So that's why there, there's this other persona that requires a specific documentation for uh, developing tooling on top of their instance. That's not gonna be useful for anyone else except for this group. And then finally, there's uh, documentation for people who want to contribute to the framework, which is also very common when people open source uh, plugins or features, uh, because it's not that easy. It's not like it's a special way of developing backstage when you do this. So it's just that about identified what are the different personas, and then you can organize the docs. So we'll see an example of somebody who does it really well, and it's open telemetry. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but it's very different to use open telemetry as a dev because you need to put the tooling in it or as an operator uh, because you need to, to use it in a different way. And they provide this way of like straight up just, are you a dev or are you doing the upside? This is how you're gonna get started. This is gonna, this is super useful because then people can get started rapidly without having to weed through the things that are not relevant to them and then they can find value fast, which is what we all have to do nowadays. We don't have a lot of time to read things that are not relevant to us. Um, that's one way of like, dividing user roles. Then there's also the example of Prometheus. They have like a really nice documentation and uh, you can see that they have this part for new user content. Uh, it's like a specific type of documentation that's gonna be useful if you're new to Prometheus or you just heard about it. You want to know, for example, how does it compare with other options in the market and, and how like the fundamentals and like introduction to the introduction kind of topics. So you know what it is about because it's, it's not a, an easy thing to understand. And then there's also another part for new users, which is about practical stuff. How do you get value as a new user? Because that's what we need to uh, optimize for, for new users. We don't need to tell them a story of how oh, they found there or we founded this three years ago because blah, blah, blah. they don't care. They want to get to see if this is gonna be useful for them and how much effort it requires. So you need to get them started and be, make them be able to prove value of your tool as soon as possible. So you give them like this minimum viable path that they can follow with practical stuff and some conceptual content and then they, they should be ready to go. So that's for uh, different personas on the documentation. But then there's also different types of... Uh, I'm, I just don't trust this pointer. Okay. Then there's also project... Uh, the documentation types. Because not all documentation is the same. There's conceptual documentation. There's step-by-step uh, -step documentation. Um, there's uh, like business value documentation on how to showcase like this works. So there's feature documentations. So uh, at the end, the whole purpose of documentation is to enable someone to do something useful with our project. So that's what we need to ask ourselves. What are we enabling people for? And uh, as I was saying, one of the first things that we need to optimize for is that we can have people prove value. Because nowadays, your project is probably not the only that exists. There's alternatives. So you want to be able to explain to people why they should choose yours. Um, there's also documentation that's useful for explaining the foundation parts because that's gonna be very interesting so people can do more and learn how to make it more intuitive for themselves, how to build on top of your, your project. Um, there's also like the showcasing the features, which is the MIDI part because at the end, Nobody uses the project for fun. They want to solve the real things. They want to achieve goals. So this is also very interesting to, to showcase like in a very straightforward manner. So they don't have to weed through things. Um, then there's hands-on enablement, which is tutorials, guides, and step-by-step -step kind of stuff. Maybe even 
uh, little laboratories or workshops that you may have set up. Uh, that's kind of another type of documentation that is required at the end. Uh, let's look at more examples with, from Prometheus documentation. Uh, so you can see that they, they have this clear path where they have conceptual document content, which is just called, literally called concepts, which is just a very clear and easy way of communicating that this is where you'll find this kind of content. But they also have key features just on the same level of hierarchy. The sidebar is very important in documentation because that's the first thing that you can see. You cannot expect user to like go through all your nav and opening all the things until they find the right path. So you can, it's useful to have like, this is what you can use. This is how you can use uh, Prometheus for alerting. This is how you can use it for this, for that, for that. And that just simplifies everybody's life. And then there's also a step-by-step -step content, which is uh, gonna be the dr drilling into the specifics of this is how you set it up for X or for Y. And it provides this like, like you know, tutorial style kind of content, which is always, always appreciated by people getting started on as a reference as you implement. Then they also have a, a little bit of a mixed bag in best, best practices, which it, is perfectly fine. And that's also that we, what we have here as well, just some best practices for documentation in general. We have, uh, for example, the concept, this is something that uh, the CNCF Tech Talks uh, audit also recommended, having very short pages, make them very concise. We often have the temptation of saying, oh, well, I can put these docs in this page because it kind of talks about the same thing, but then you're gonna make it very hard for people to find this information and very hard for you to keep it updated because then maybe a part of the documentation changes, but the rest doesn't, so it becomes very messy when you have versioning. It's not very clear what changed. So make the pages insular. It's better to have 10 different small pages than to have one super long page for, for many reasons, even for SEO, for the discoverability of the content. So that's something that it's, it's often the temptation to be like, just, just drop it in that page, but it's better to make it separate. Uh, another thing is include an API reference, which I guess is, uh, is very common, but just in case mentioning that it's, uh, if you have an API specification, just drop it in the documentation. Uh, make it searchable, that's gonna save so many lives uh, because we don't have time or we can, it's very easy to miss things in the nav bar or just very specific terms may get lost. So just make it searchable is available for, for users. And this is also important, make plans early for, for versioning because your project will definitely evolve. The APIs that you have today will not be the APIs that we'll have in a year from now or two years from now you're eventually gonna rewrite the entire thing over the course of years. So you need to be able to have versioning early. You may not need to do it like right the first year, but you need to be able to plan at least how you're gonna support this. And that may include choosing the right uh, documentation framework or knowing what you can expect in that regard. And then similarly to that is uh, plan for localization. Because uh, when your project becomes very successful, which it will because you're following the best documentation practices, you are gonna have people uh, that want documentation in other languages. And this is also a very nice way of getting contributions. It's, it's quite common that people in uh, localized communities want to contribute content in their own language, which is very nice. Uh, and, uh, it's a nice experience and it's good to have it enabled earlier. So we have covered some, some tips on, on project documentation, let's um, briefly review some stuff for contributor documentation, which includes things like the readme, includes uh, the contributing file and, and issues. So one, one thing to have into account is to have all channels of communication clearly marked, because sometimes you know you operate on Discord, but then do you know it? Is it clear to everybody? Is it really marked on the repo, on the website? Because otherwise it's unclear, where do we communicate? Or do we communicate some, through some other Slack channel? Or it, It's better to just be very explicit about where you expect the communications and which what purpose. Are you going to say that you're going to have Discord for support? And I don't know, like GitHub issues for other kind of stuff or the GitHub forums. There are so many ways of engaging nowadays that it's best to make very explicitly um, available to the, the users how to communicate with you 
about the project and how to communicate that they want to contribute, how do you support them, that should all be documented somehow. Um, it's also very important to have scheduled um, meetings because the project is, it's okay if you want to do everything async, that's maybe the case for a lot of projects, but eventually the project will grow so complex that you will need to sync up with I mean, even among your, your organization sponsoring the, the project or with contributors or with adopters to figure out how are they using it and get feedback from the community. It's, it's often unavoidable to have regular meetings and I think it's very healthy because then the people can hang out and you can see a face if you have cameras and understand how people are using your project, which is ultimately what's going to inform how the project will evolve. So that kind of meetings, it's best to have them scheduled on a predictable pace and that, that space has to be also very visible and explicit to people so they can know when to join and how to join and which are the channels. So all these communication channels are just integrated and, and easy to, to follow. Um, then we have a, a, a guide for new contributors, which is also going to be unavoidable. There's always going to be, that, that's what we want, right? But just as we want new users, we want new contributors. And that's, that documentation can be the, the, the people that are going to be contributing, they are like more, more savvy, let's say, or more invested in the project. So we do not need to make them as tidy as the new user uh, documentation, but it's still, it's useful to give them like which environments you need to set up and all of these nice things so they can contribute smoothly. And then another thing that is interesting for the contribution is the project's governance, because if you are going to commit time to contribute something to this project, you want to know what to expect, who's going to own it, how is support for your efforts going to be received, or are you going to create this PR and it's going to be abandoned completely? Who do you reach out to if you have problems? That's, or who is even going to maintain this after this? Are you expected to maintain this feature forever? Like, what's the commitment? That's something that has to be communicated explicitly also for the well-being of the maintainers, because otherwise the assumption is, oh, I'm going to contribute this and the maintainers are going to have to take care of it forever, which is happening in many projects and it's very burdensome for, for maintainers. So it's better to set very clear expectations. Um, now for the website, uh, some tips and ideas. This is something that I could talk about for, I don't know, hours because it's my job to do websites. I, I work in marketing, but on the, the good marketing people. Um, so one recommendation specifically for open source project is to keep the website on a single source, which is often the case that uh, you have, you, you're building the docs in a repo, then you have like the uh, landing pages in some other place and it becomes very difficult to maintain. Uh, so one recommendation that the CNCF does is try as much as possible to have a single source where you can compile it. It could be as its own special repo for the website where you can compile the, the docs reference, where you can compile the, the API and the marketing landing pages because that's going to make it easy for you to maintain and it's going to make it possible for people to contribute, which a lot of the times you want people to contribute to your landing pages and your docs. And if you have one single place where they do it, it's easy to tell them, hey, you just go there and change it. The, if there's an error or if there's something that they want to a page uh, or a tutorial or something, it's going to be easier if they have a, one single way of doing it. Um, another thing is usability. Make sure, even though like a minority of people will use it on a mobile device, it's still some people who might use it. And generally, it's going to uh, make it easy for you to, so the documentation is available for different kind of screen sizes. Thankfully, we have already this uh, day and age, uh, a lot of libraries for documentation that already do this work for us, but just not everybody has, has adopted those for just a check. And then something very critical that is often left behind or not even relied on on, on, on open source projects is having some sort of social proof. Because just as you need to uh, learn how to use it and show value, you can develop trust if you can showcase, hey, all these companies are already using us. Maybe you should try it. Yeah, like we are trustworthy of your time. And this is something trivial relatively once you have a few adopters. Just like talk with them and say, hey, 
do you want to be showcased in this page? And you can work on case studies, which is going to be super useful, especially for champions that uh, want to use your project in their organization. They need some resources to, to prove to their boss that this is not some crazy open source project, that there's this something solid, that people are using it, and then they can trust better. That's going to be a uh, worthy investment. Another thing to consider, and it sounds way too marketing, but it's very real. You need to take into account the search engine optimization for your uh, open source project website. And that may mean using uh, the right terms, making sure the markdown on your pages is hierarchical and compliant. Because otherwise, what's going to happen is that like the private source competitors are going to eat your pages. They're going to create a lot of pages, so you, you, everybody searching for your project will not even get to your website because they, they know how to play it. And even if you're the source of reference, they know how to like dump you down the, the list. So it's better to be prepared. Just make a, a good work with your the way you use the language and your, your HTML. And that, that can go a long way and, and protect you from being forgotten even in your own search terms. Um, and also keeping track of analytics is also useful to see, uh, for example, you can detect how documentation is performing a little bit indirectly by saying if the drop rate in this tutorial is like five seconds, maybe people are getting stuck. Maybe this, this like command is wrong and people are just leaving because the amount of people who will tell you that it's wrong, it means like a hundred people tried it and they just abandoned it until somebody tells you, hey, this doesn't work. So it, it's better to keep some eye a little bit to see what's performing, what's not performing, where are people dropping out. Maybe this means that they don't understand what we're doing, or maybe we have to rephrase how we talk about our, pro our project in the homepage. It can be super useful. And then uh, last but definitely not least is uh, planning. Uh, maintenance of the website and in general the documentation is good it's healthy to go through the website let's say once a year and say oh this messaging this is not really what we do anymore we found out that people are using us in this way so let's change our hero image or, 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 or tagline um, yes now what is great documentation that's the question that we wanted to ask and just maybe Short, some short pointers, uh, project documentation. A great project documentation achieves something and that is that it helps the user according to their needs and it enables them to find what they need fast. So that encapsulates pretty much the, the way of segregating documentation by different roles, making insular smaller pages, make it searchable. We, all, we do that so documentation can be useful to people according to the need we reach uh, whatever they need, and they, we have optimized the page for that. And then the contributor documentation enables uh, people to contribute in a predictable manner. That means that if I put my time maybe on a weekend to create a PR, I know what to expect. I know that the maintainers may be going to take three weeks to review it, but I, I'm okay with that but they, because they told me. So I do it consciously. And then I know what's going to happen, who has to approve it, like, I, it's predictable and I'm comfortable when I contribute when, to this project. And finally, the website. The websites, at least the way I see the website, is that it should prove that your time is worth. It's worth it to give it a shot to our project because it can solve this real problem for you. And it's, yeah, we can show you. You just give us like five more minutes, go to the docs, but just getting the confidence, like getting people to trust you enough to give you like five minutes is very hard in today's internet. So that's, that's kind of the purpose of, of the website. Uh, and it's also useful for champions. And finally, all documentation, like great documentation has everything connected, which means that the docs tell the same story as the website, as the contributing content, as the auxiliary channels, as the meetings. There's this cohesiveness and people know where to go when they need something. And that's really what we want to, to achieve. And finally, the message as well is contribute to the documentation. You don't always have to contribute code. Code is great. But a lot of time, there's a deficit in documentation uh, contribution. Like this was from yesterday's talk on the state of backstage uh, for 2024. 
And they mentioned this issue that I showed in the beginning, and it's up for grabs. There's many tasks, very, very good tasks for beginners uh, that can get you involved in, in a way of contributing to a very successful project. Like Backstage was the project with the most commits contributed in last year. So it, it shows you that it's an interesting project to, to start contributing if you want to. And documentation is a great way to start. And yeah, that's, that's all I have. Thank you uh, for coming. There's this QR for feedback, which I would really appreciate uh, so I can make other talk. And if there's anyone that has any question, we have some time. Hi, Ore. I'm Nate, a uh, technical writer with the CNCF. Uh, thank you so much for going through this process and doing this. Um, well, first off, thank you for, for working with us on this program. This was a, was a lot of fun working with you. Um, and I'm going to hijack a little bit here. Uh, if there's anybody who is a maintainer in the room um, and you would like to, to, to go through this process with us, uh, you're welcome to open up um, a service desk ticket or reach out to me on Slack, Nate W. Uh, and the other thing I'd like to um, let folks know about is every... I guess it's the last Wednesday of every month we have a, um, a tech writer's open office hours. Uh, for anybody who's got any questions about um, technical documentations, we bring uh, tech writers in, we have conversations, we go through um, uh, all of the stuff that uh, Jorge has been talking about. And uh, the way you can find that is in the CNCF Slack. Uh, I'll make sure that we put up a um, piece of information um, with uh, the, the Zoom details and all that in the CNCF Tech Docs uh, channel in, um, in Slack. So, sorry for hijacking. Thank you so much, Jorge. This is great. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. I think everybody should know it. And yeah, great. Yeah, Nate is amazing to work with. So, if you have a CNCF project, you should definitely go for it. Or just a commentation, as you said, for the open office. It's going to be amazing. I learned a lot. Thank you. Have a great uh, afternoon.